Hey guys, Caitlin here. And for this week's episode, I want to talk about hypokalemia and specifically the EKG changes and the treatment of a high potassium. So when a patient comes into the emergency department, the lab value of changes in their potassium may be found when you get your basic labs, or they may have the chief complaint of it where they found this lab value in an outside facility and now they're coming in to get temporizing treatment. You want to take these patients very seriously. They may have these vague complaints of like fatigue, um, nausea, paresthesias, but the more serious complaints are shortness of breath and possible pulmonary edema, and you see this a lot in stage renal disease, or any cardiac arrhythmias. So let's get started. So when it comes to a couple different drugs that can cause hypokalemia, um, it's just the side effect profile of the drug. So these may include ACE inhibitors, digoxin, beta blockers, and obviously potassium sparing diuretics. Um, but the very high potassium patients usually come from an end-stage renal patient that might have missed their last dialysis. And these are the patients you definitely need to worry about, uh, pulmonary edema and cardiac arrhythmias. And it, when it comes to EKG changes in these patients, we've all been taught the peak T waves are a sign of hypokalemia, but there are many other subtle changes in an EKG before these patients might progress to a cardiac arrhythmia. So let's take a look at a couple EKGs. So in this picture, you can see the typical progression of hyperkalemia on an EKG. So around four, you might see a normal EKG because that is in the normal range of hypokalemia. Um, when you get up to six or seven with your potassium, you will start to see peak T waves. Uh, seven or eight, you will start to see flattening of the P waves, prolonged pre-R interval, and sometimes a depressed ST segment. And then at ar around eight or nine, you will see uh, prolonged QRS, and that's when it starts to get very dangerous. And then at greater than nine, you will start seeing that sine wave pattern. But just keep in mind that not all presentations of hyperkalemia will present this way, as some people are chronically high in their K, and so they will not sometimes have EKG changes because their body is kind of used to this. So just keep this in mind that this is a fairly relative in the progression of hyperkalemia on an EKG. In this next EKG, you can see the beginning of the peak T waves and the small indiscernible P waves that you see at the beginning of hyperkalemia. Uh, make sure you just have a high suspicion of this in any patient where you might suspect hyperkalemia. Grab that EKG and start looking for these two beginning stages of EKG findings for hyperkalemia. Just like the previous example, you can see similar findings of peak T waves and small P waves in this EKG. These two findings are most prominent in leads V3 through V6. I always tend to look at V4 and go from there. The next finding of hyperkalemia is when you need to start sweating and getting nervous, and that's when your QRS widens. So on this EKG, you can see the peak T waves, smaller P waves, and the QRS widening. The definition of QRS widening is greater than 120 milliseconds. You want to treat these individuals especially quickly because the next step after the QRS widens is weird arrhythmias. And with hyperkalemia, any arrhythmia can put itself and bradycardia, tachycardia, V-fib are all possible and some very bizarre arrhythmias too. So just keep that in mind when you're treating a very bizarre arrhythmia. You can't exactly categorize, just keep hyperkalemia on your differential. Okay guys, this is a EKG that I got from one of our frequently visited end-stage renal disease patients, and he came in with uh, yeah, potassium around 8.9. And I just want to show you this as an example of some of the bizarre arrhythmias that can happen from hyperkalemia. So if you ever see a weird arrhythmia, make sure to check their K, ask if they're um, an end-stage renal disease patient, and go from there and start correcting it. Now, when it comes to the treatment of hyperkalemia in the emergency department, a lot of what we do is temporizing, um, either it be stabilizing the cardiac membrane or just moving potassium intracellularly. Uh, these patients tend to crash quickly, so we like to use quick treatments. And those two treatments usually work in a couple of hours, if not a couple of minutes. But there are a couple of treatments that do treat a high potassium if it's more chronic in nature or if it's not too high that we're worried about 
any cardiac arrhythmias are crashing, and one of those is KXLA, and this is removal of potassium via the stool, and this usually works in a couple of days. And then the other is Lasix, and this usually works in a couple of hours. And um, But if your patient does not make urine, like in end-stage renal disease patients, uh, this won't work. So just keep that in mind. Ask the end-stage renal disease patient, hey, do you still make urine? And if they don't, then this drug will not be useful. Now, the next three drugs I want to talk about are insulin, albuterol, and sodium bicarb. And these three drugs work by moving potassium back intracellularly. And insulin is one of the more common drugs I like to use in the emergency department for hyperkalemia. And I usually tag on D50 with this, so an insulin D50 combination, because if your patient has a glucose and let's say the 100s, you don't want to give them insulin and possibly cause hypoglycemia. So I just tag on D50 to stabilize their blood sugars. But if your patient has a glucose in the 300s, don't tag on any D50 because the D50 does nothing for the potassium. Um, so just give that insulin. Um, and I will especially use albuterol if a patient has underlying lung disease, but don't let that stop you from using on patients that have no lung disease because this is definitely a good temporizing measure for hyperkalemia. And I love to give sodium bicarb if a patient's pH is less than 7. Now, the last drug I want to talk about, and probably the most important drug, is calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. And calcium works by stabilizing the cardiac membrane. So it will literally prevent cardiac arrhythmias in hyperkalemia. Um, and usually this is given in a code situation. So an end-stage renal disease comes in coding. Um, we want to make sure that we stabilize those cardiac membranes. And if the reason is hyperkalemia, which um, it is in a lot of cases, then we are stabilizing those membranes. And usually the patient just pops out of that weird rhythm that they may be in. Another indication to use this drug is any type of EKG changes. Um, like I said before, hypokalemia patients tend to crash quickly. So just getting that calcium gluconate on board and into the patient um, is a great idea with any EKG changes. And um, consider it with other high potassiums as well. It is not dangerous. Alrighty, and that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, see you next week.